So how many stocks should you buy? That's the subject we're gonna be covering in this video. So if you're looking for information on diversification or building a stock portfolio, then you're in the right place. So I'm gonna start by telling you a little story about a successful business person who sold their business, netted a million dollars from cashing out. With the million dollars of cash, their plan was to reinvest that money in a way that would earn a decent return. So he had decent relationships with the other business owners in the city, and he had the opportunity to invest some of the money into some of these other local businesses. Of those businesses, he felt that he had a pretty good understanding of about 30 of them, which was good because he only wanted to invest his money in businesses that he understood. And then besides the criteria of needing to understand the business, he also only wanted to invest in businesses that he felt had a good future, and then of course that were available to buy at a reasonable price. So of the 30 that he understood, he focused on the businesses that he felt most confident in his ability to estimate the future profits for. And then after his detailed analysis, he selected his five favorite and invested $200,000 into each of them. Okay, so now before I continue, let me ask you this. Did the way he decided to invest this money sound like a risky strategy to you? So in my opinion, I'd actually say that he approached it pretty sensibly and pretty carefully. And I definitely wouldn't consider this approach to be all that particularly risky. Now, if he had no idea how to read financial statements, then yeah, what he did would be a little bit more risky. However, since he knew what he was doing, I would say that his behavior was pretty sensible. And by the way, hit the like button on this video below if you agree with that. Okay, so this story is an anecdote that comes from Joel Greenblatt. And it's to point out that for some reason, the perception of what is considered risky and in investing seemingly changes the moment moment you divide the ownership of a company into billions of shares that are easily traded on the stock market. By the way, Joel Greenblatt's book is called The Little Book That Beats the Market, and it's definitely worth reading. So nonetheless, while our businessman slash investor from the story appears to have been acting sensibly when he decided to divide his million dollars up amongst the five businesses which he understood the most and thought were the best investments, if we were to change that story around and say that he divided his money up amongst five different stocks, there's a lot of people that all of a sudden would consider this to be much more risky behavior. So then what is investment risk? So here's how I would define it. And I would imagine that our businessman slash investor from earlier would agree with me. So here it is. Investment risk to me is the risk of permanent loss of your purchasing power. And the reason I say loss of purchasing power rather than loss of money is so that we're also accounting for inflation as well. Because as you probably know, $1 today does not have the same purchasing power that a dollar 10 years from now will have. And in the same way, you probably know that a dollar 10 years ago had much more purchasing power than a dollar does today. So inflation slowly reduces our purchasing power. And that's also why putting your money into a savings account right now is a very bad investment. If you were to put your money into a savings account and let it sit there for the next 10 years, yeah, you will have not lost any money, but you will certainly have lost a significant amount of purchasing power. Just look at the price of homes. In some places, what you could have bought 20 years ago for $100,000 would now cost you a million bucks and it will only just continue like this. So an investor's goal should be at the bare minimum to at least maintain their purchasing power. And ideally, to earn a rate of return on top of that. So therefore, in my opinion, the risk to avoid in investing is just failing to achieve this goal. However, like Joel Greenblatt said, something strange happens the moment we divide the ownership of a company up into a few billion different shares that are easily traded. What's happened is that the academics and the professors of the world have come up with their own definition of risk, which to them is based on volatility. In other words, the more volatile a stock's price movement is, the more risky it is to them. So if a stock stock's price were to drop by 20%, for example, in their world, it would be instantly considered more volatile and therefore more risky. However, for our businessman slash investor, this would be kind of counterintuitive, right? To him, being able to buy the same five businesses that he had selected, but at a 20% discount would make the whole endeavor seem a lot less risky. A lot of the serious fortunes that have been made in history have been made by owning one or two great companies. And now that's not necessarily what I'm telling you to do. However, it's worth keeping in mind and remembering. You don't need to own a ton of different companies to get rich. Now I'd imagine that most people watching this would agree that some level of diversification does make some sense. But what's the magic number? One of the risks that you might hear talked about when it comes to stock investing is something called non-market risk. It's also referred to as unsystematic risk. And this is essentially the risk of making a big mistake in one of your stock picks or the risk of something happening that's completely out of everybody's control or anybody's ability to predict like something maybe like a factory burning down and for some reason not being covered by insurance or a regulatory change that just really really hurts a business in a dramatic way or maybe perhaps a competitor comes in with some new technology and just completely gobbles up all the market share you know the type of risk that invented the saying don't put all your eggs in one basket so you can diversify away this risk it's been suggested that statistically speaking owning two stocks reduces this risk by 46%. Owning four stocks reduces this risk by 72%. Owning eight stocks reduces this risk by 81%. 16 stocks reduces this 
risk by 93% and 32 stocks reduce this risk by 96%. This type of risk is reduced by 99% once you own 500 stocks. So I found that pretty interesting and obviously these numbers aren't perfect because if you own 20 stocks in the same industry, for example, and that industry somehow imploded, then obviously that would make these statistics look very wrong. However, there's been various studies done based on random stock picking and some studies have suggested that you need to own even more stocks than I just said to reduce this type of risk by as much as I just said. However, I do feel pretty good about the numbers that I just said, considering that we're not going to be picking our stocks just randomly and there will be a fair amount of due diligence involved before buying. You can come to your own conclusion on this one. However, it's my opinion that there's not much additional risk reduction in this regard by owning much more than 10 stocks. If you're taking the time to do your research and due diligence and you feel that you truly understand the company you're investing in. Just to give you an idea of how much time Warren Buffett spends doing research and due diligence, check out this clip of one of the Berkshire Hathaway investment managers, Todd Combs. Yeah, when he came to Columbia and spoke to the business school in uh, Professor Bruce Greenwald's class in uh, it was either late 01 or early 02, uh, the very last question that was posed to him was uh, what his secret was. And he had this, kind of, for, never forget it, he had this giant pile of paper and he pulled it out. It was a complete hodgepodge and said that he reads 500 pages a week. And uh, anyone can do it. And, uh, you know, it's like compound knowledge. If you start today, it would just build over time. And so that's when I started. And it, so it's somewhere around 500, sometimes a little bit more pages a week. And that can be all those things I mentioned before, annual reports and transcripts and regulatory filings and so forth. So I'd say he's probably reading at least one annual report every day. However, it for sure wouldn't be word for word that he's reading them because he'd definitely be familiar with the format. And there's a lot of repetition in those financial reports. So he would know how to skim them and skip through to the important parts. But that should at least give you an idea. And Warren Buffett is someone who's very willing to basically buy as much as he possibly can when he finds an investment opportunity that's worthwhile. And his ability to do that really just comes along with the conviction and confidence that you get from really just knowing your stuff. So here's what I'd tell you. Figure out how much research and due diligence you're willing to do, which will be somewhere between zero and Warren Buffett level, and then let that help you decide how many stocks to own. If your answer is zero, then your best option is going to be to buy broad market index funds, and that's exactly what Warren Buffett suggests most people do. And if that's what sounds most appealing to you, then you should check out this video here to learn all about that. Personally, I think that if you want to be lazy about it, but you still want to beat the market, I think that it's possible without doing as much research as Warren Buffett does, as long as you grasp the concepts of value investing, and you're still doing a decent amount of research, maybe owning somewhere between five and 20 stocks, assuming that you have a decent understanding of each of them. And of course, assuming that you've purchased them at a reasonable price, I think that should be enough to beat the market. Owning any more than that, though, I think starts to make the whole thing kind of pointless. Now, by the way, if you've been watching my videos for a while, you already know this. However, I should point out that when I say pay a reasonable price, I don't mean reasonable price in relation to its historical price, but rather I mean a reasonable price in relation to its intrinsic value. And that right there is a really important fundamental. So if what I just said isn't something you fully understand yet, that's okay. But it just means that you still have a little bit to learn before you start buying individual stocks. And if that's the case, I would suggest checking out this video sometime in the near future. Something else to consider when it comes to all of this is that even if you do put in the time required to pick individual companies to invest in, and then just own a handful of the best opportunities that you've found, in the end, you may end up only doing just as good as the stock market average anyways. So then the question becomes, would it have been better to just buy index funds instead? And to have used all that time that was spent researching to instead just simply earn more money to be able to contribute more to your investments? Yeah, it's possible. But then of course, there's also an opportunity cost to this as well. Because knowing how to value companies and earning high returns can be very rewarding, especially because of the way compounding growth works. So when it comes to diversification, it all comes down to this. The more diversified you are, the more average your results will be. And there's definitely a limit to how many companies you can truly understand and form a worthwhile opinion on. So if you're going to choose to pick individual stocks, then you should for sure limit yourself to just the companies you understand, and then just own a handful or maybe two of the best opportunities that you find within the ones that you understand. Otherwise, you'll probably be better off just buying index funds on a regular basis using dollar cost averaging. For me, most of my net worth is in three stocks, but I do currently own 16 stocks in total as of right now. However, with that said, some of them I just own one single share of. So here's what I would suggest if you're new and just getting started and you're wanting to build a portfolio. This is a very good exercise and a good way to start. First, make a list of all the public companies that you feel like you understand and that you'd be happy to own. For this, you could scroll through the list of companies in the S&P 500 and pick out some names you recognize, or you could go through Joel Greenblatt's 
free stock screener at magicformulainvesting.com. So those are two good ways to find some stocks to add to your list. And then once you have a list of maybe 30 or more, from there, try your hand at valuing each of them and determining what sort of annual return on investment you get from purchasing them at their current prices. This video here has a good guide on calculating intrinsic value that you can follow along with. Now, I personally like to run the rough numbers like this first to confirm it's potentially interesting before I dive deeper. But if it's looking decent numbers wise, then the next step is to read the company's most recent annual report. And then while you're reading, pay special attention to the footnotes and the management discussion parts, as well as look to see how the financials compare year over year and quarter to quarter. If you're being thorough, you should go back and read as much as five to 10 years worth of annual reports before you buy. And while you're doing all of this, if any of the companies are too hard to understand or too hard to figure out a value for, you should just remove them from the list. Okay, and now by the end of this little exercise, I guarantee that you'll have learned so much and it should also leave you now with a short list of companies that may be interesting and potentially worth buying shares of. A lot of the companies on that list will be companies that you do like, but they won't be currently trading at a nice enough price to be a decent investment. And for those ones, you'll still wanna keep them on a little watch list to potentially revisit in the future. And if it turns out there's some companies that you are interested in buying some shares of right now, then it's really up to you to decide how much you wanna put into each of them, depending on your level of confidence and your level of conviction. You definitely do gain more confidence and conviction the more experienced you are. And so if you're brand new, then it might be better to spread your money across your 10 best ideas rather than your three best ideas. You're really just gonna have to judge your own confidence and your own conviction levels and make the decision for yourself. As you become more experienced, your confidence will grow. And with the added conviction that comes along with that, you can become more and more concentrated if you'd like. I'm personally a very reluctant seller just in general, and I think that's a pretty good practice. However, you're naturally gonna keep learning. And if you learn something new and then re-examine the current stocks you own, and then you realize that there's some of them that you don't wanna own anymore because of the new knowledge that you've discovered, or even if you've found something new that you'd prefer to own much more, then I would say that it's totally fine to change your mind and sell something so that you can buy something else. However, don't change your mind just because of price swings. You should be changing your mind because of something fundamental. Price swings in and of themselves don't mean anything, and nor do they change anything about the underlying business's future prospects. That right there is also something that should make complete sense to you already, and if it doesn't make complete sense to you yet, then you should watch this video here before you start buying individual stocks. So another question that I get a lot is about diversifying across bonds and real estate instead of just stocks. And personally, I'm not interested. When interest rates are super low like they are right now, bonds are just really not attractive at all. Your returns from owning bonds are not gonna be good. And it would be a lot like putting money into a savings account like we talked about earlier. So if some of your money is in bonds, it's gonna drag down your overall performance quite a lot. And as for real estate, personally, I'm not interested. Real estate, I find, is a pretty competitive game. And I just think that the stock market is a much more level playing field and I'd much rather specialize in stocks than be a master of neither one of them. I wanna leave you now with a particular clip of Warren Buffett talking about diversification. However, first a quick reminder, I'm not a financial advisor, so please don't take my content as financial advice. I'm just someone who loves investing and has spent a lot of time learning about it and thinking about it. Okay, so now listen to what Warren Buffett said when somebody asked him about diversification. We like to put a lot of money in things that, uh, that we feel strongly about. And that gets back to the diversification question. We think diversification is, as practice generally, makes very little sense for anyone that knows what they're doing. Diversification is a protection against ignorance. I mean, if you wanna make sure that nothing bad happens to you relative to the market, you own everything. There's nothing wrong with that. I mean, that, that is a perfectly sound approach for somebody who, who does not feel they know how to analyze businesses. If you know how to analyze businesses and value businesses, it's crazy to own 50 stocks or 40 stocks or 30 stocks probably uh, because there aren't that many wonderful businesses at, that are understandable to a single human being in all likelihood and, it, and to have some super wonderful business and then put money in number 30 or 35 on your list of attractiveness and, and forego putting more money into number one just strikes Charlie and me as, as, as madness and it, it, it's conventional practice and it it, it may, uh, you know, if all you have to achieve is, is average, uh, it it's, uh, it, it's, uh, may preserve your job, but it, it's a confession in our view that you don't really understand the businesses that you own. Three wonderful businesses is, 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 more, than, uh, is more than you need in this life to do very well.